All right, and we're back. Welcome to another live stream. Um, and as always, thank you for joining. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, Kev, what are we up to today, man? Well, I've started off having technical issues straight away, right? With my Wi-Fi is per standard. But yeah, you know, quick introductions, right? All around as well. We've got the amazing Robin Smorenberg as well. Cloud architect at NordCloud. You've got me, Kevin Evans, Cloud Solution Architect as well at Microsoft. And today we're going to be speaking to Paul, who, Paul Ivey, who's a, a, well, I'm going to say ex-colleague because we still work at the same company, right, Paul? But we're, we're in different, different parts of the world now. But I worked with Paul back in the UK, and Paul was my, he was like a brain box with anything that I had, anything to do with code or anything to do with DevOps, and, you know, in particular GitHub or Azure DevOps, et cetera. And you, you you worked in apps and innovation, right, Paul? That's where you're aligned to. So I'll let you do a introduction about yourself. But before we start, you know, if you find this useful and you still want me and Robin to turn up and make make these episodes and shows, right, then don't forget to like and subscribe and don't forget to join the community as well on Discord. So let me, Paul, let me get that uh, one up. Go on, yeah. go on, go on, go on. It's camouflage, that. man, because you have a red shirt. Nah, man, this is uh, <laughs> Calgary Flames, right? I'm ripping my city, so. When you sit up, I don't worry. It's not one of those streams, is it? No, no, no. It's uh, <laughs> it's my hockey team now, man. Yeah, subscribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, Paul, do you want to give yourself an introduction? Yeah, sure. So um, thanks for that, Kevin. So obviously, Paul Ivey. Uh, I've been working at Microsoft, um, one of Kevin's colleagues, for... Uh, just over four years now. It was my four-year anniversary at the weekend. Uh, started off as a, thank you, as a what was Premier Field Engineer, became Customer Engineer, and is now Cloud Solution Architect. Um, That's right, started, yeah. Yeah, it's a brilliant journey. Um, started on-prem um, as a senior engineer, um, dealing with all things like SCCM, Azure Active Directory, DNS, DHCP, all of that cool stuff that we all used to play around with. Then moved into things like Intune, um, which then got rebranded re and then unrebranded again, uh, and then moved into digital and app innovation, helping customers um, deliver solutions, develop solutions for the cloud, um, specifically in Azure and specifically as uh, Kev kind of alluded to, my speciality was DevOps and especially like CI, CD pipelines, all that kind of cool stuff. And now uh, I am a Microsoft technical trainer delivering uh, training to help people pass Microsoft developer um, exam. Talk about the right guy for the right job. I mean, he, <laughs> I mean, amount of, times, amount of times I would ping you, right? And ask, for, ask questions or information, like, you know, just unblocking those uh, niche scenarios, you know. You're an I think giving money to other people I noticed as well. Like I've got I've, too many people contacting me because of you. <laughs> it's rep reputation, Paul. It's decent reputation, that's all it is, right? I'll take but it. yeah, and you know, we're going to get onto this later on in the episode, but now you're even writing books, Paul, right? To help people pass their exams. So, yeah, let's <laughs> so the AZ204 exam, Robin's got his because he lives a lot closer to Paul, right? That's the excuse I'm giving. Mine's still uh, making its way across the Atlantic, but yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that book, right? Because that exam is, is a great path, right? For any folks. I want to go down that cloud native route, right, in Azure, right, and start that process. So, but before before we get onto that, we've we've got a subject to cover. Is that right, Paul? We do. Yeah, it was. So obviously, I, I co-authored the book, and one of my favorite chapters was app services, uh, specifically. Nice. Every I say specifically everything about app services that you need to know, basically, for the AZ two hundred four exam. Um, so we've got a couple of things that we want to talk about and introduce. Um, as a bit of a teaser, I guess, for that chapter. Um, so I've got some high-level-ish information and a couple of demos that um, that I'll, I'll like to share with you, with your viewers. All right. So I'm going to do that right now. Yeah, shall I pull up your screen? Please do. Well, bef yeah. before we do that, I want to touch a little bit on your background because I think it's really interesting, as in, okay, started on infrastructure, right? DSP, oh, no, DNS, yeah. domain controllers, well, all that stuff, right? Started as well, and Kev, I guess you too. A lot of us, right? Yep. Uh, moved into DevOps. Well, that was a natural progression for me as well. And then started writing books for developers. I'm like, wow, that's 
it's like two ends of well it's not if you look at devops not anymore but it used to be like two ends of the spectrum right yeah and it's quite funny because the majority of colleagues of mine or former colleagues kind of as kevin said <laughs> um started from a developer perspective and then had to kind of get into the ops side of things if they wanted to get into DevOps. But I came from a different perspective. So I came from hardcore engineering and architecture, um, but I ended up developing more than I was engineering or, or helping with the engineer side of things. So I was developing add-ons that actually made their way into some of our products as well. Um, so I came from that and then started doing the dev stuff. Um, and then, so I had a nice perspective of, of that um, ops side of things. So that was really good. And as far as, uh, the book side of things like my my career path and why i picked that as well um i got i got approached by pact pact publishing um i got loads of their books when i was studying like programming and vr and ar and stuff which we won't go into right now um and they just said hey look you've you've obviously got the exam you seem like you know what you're doing do you want to do a book and i was like yeah you know what i could do with learning more about azure services so uh, what better way to learn more about these things than to write a book on it? It's one way to challenge yourself. It is. It's like they say, right? To validate your knowledge is the best way of teaching folks, right? And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in this because when I started off my Azure journey, I worked with a development team and it was all PaaS. I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, ACES, I was doing uh, Logic Apps, I was doing all that good stuff. Then I went back into consultancy and got dragged back into infrastructure, right? So like it's a natural habitat for me, I'll be quite honest, right? But I still miss that, you know, just you know, loading up your uh, your instance or whatever it may be, and then just loading your code into it, right? And watching it flourish. And you don't really have to like, you know, water and feed it, right? That's the whole beauty of a PaaS offering is, you know, Microsoft will, will take care of it. A certain percentage of that, and I need to make that clear, right, to folks, right, because yeah. it's not a just chuck your code at it and away it goes, right. It's all secure and everything. But I'm sure you'll touch on that, Paul, at a late, later point. But yeah, Certainly. it's interesting. Always, yeah, yeah, it is, and I can always come back for another session specifically around CI/CD and stuff if we need to. So. I know that was what you wanted me on before you, about. So <laughs> you, you just volunteered yourself, Paul. So uh, you're on the list. So yeah, there's a lot of folks out there that will uh, <laughs> that will want to want to see that. But yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Yeah. Would that be Azure DevOps specifically, or GitHub Actions, or both? Probably more around GitHub, to be honest, as that's kind yeah. of the strategic direction of the world. And I'm in love with GitHub Actions, honestly. Interesting. Interesting. And I got two with the three sets as well, so that helps. Yeah, well, I'm still trying to figure out if Azure DevOps is here to stay or that it's going to be. It is. Yeah? It is. It is here it's, to stay. The roadmap it's, is. Sure. It's yeah. a, it seems to be a conversation I'm having quite a lot lately, right, with customers, right? Because, you know, we obviously purchased GitHub back in was it 20, I'm going to say 2016, 20, I always get confused between LinkedIn, the LinkedIn purchase, right, and GitHub, right? There were two massive acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's difficult because customers ask the same question you know you've got github that's where all the developers live right and that's how they work but then we have a lot of customers that you know say like data residency laws right you still can't really do that with github but you can spin up an azure devops instance right within you know the country of origin and that kind of thing or if you've got certain project management um, applications that you need to do then you'd stick with azure devops but the, the, the main message is they're both here to stay. They're going to be here for around a long time, right? And you can still use them. I think it's just more of a preference of where your your teams and your ops teams and your developers feel most comfortable, right? And what your compliancy uh, reg, you know, requirements are. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, ultimately. And there are certain features, the GitHub enterprise-ready features, I would say, yeah. that GitHub is working on but isn't quite there. But Azure DevOps have been doing it for ages, right? But certainly any any new endeavors, um, I'd be encouraging people for um, DevOps unless there's a, spe uh, sorry, for GitHub, unless there's a specific reason That's not right. to, rather than yeah. the other way around. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that was not today's topic, but I think we, we can, well, <laughs> we're changing the, the topic of today's episode, guys. No, I don't know. Right. <laughs> Azure DevOps and GitHub, right? But uh no, let's uh, let's yeah. let's keep that one for another time. Shall I pull up your screen, uh, Paul? Please do. Yeah, yeah. All right. You can see my incredibly crude drawing here. So 
I'm not a fan of slides, despite being a trainer, but as part of being a trainer, uh, we do a little doodling. So as we said, Azure App Services, we're going to give like a real brief kind of high level view of what App Services is. Then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about some specifics that for some reason catch a lot of people out. And then I'll go into a, a demo and I'll try and keep an eye on the clock as well. So Azure App Services or Azure App Service, as it's often called, um, it's an HTTP based service where you can host web applications, also APIs, REST APIs. And that's something a lot of people don't realize as well is it's often gets called and actually the, the, the um, section of the exam is Azure App Service web apps, but don't get that confused to think that you can only host web apps on app services, do REST APIs, mobile backends, and something that doesn't really come up, at least there won't be much at all in the exam is this thing, web jobs, uh, web jobs, essentially it's, it's kind of old school now, um, but it's still, still running. And that's, um, kind of your business process automation with, um, scripts. So you can use PowerShell scripts, uh, in the context of your app, um, or app service, uh, bash scripts, things like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of very super high level what it is. Um, it's got app services has built in auto scale support, CI CD integration. So continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, we were talking about it just now, um, deployment slots, which we will touch on today can support both Linux and windows, and you can bring your custom containers. So again, we're not going to talk uh, a whole lot of detail about custom containers. Containers is a topic that's in the exam, um, and in the book, obviously, um, but that's what app services can do. So you can, ha you can containerize your, your entire application and you can host that in Azure app services and present that as a web page or an API or whatever. So these two images at the bottom here, app services isn't solo. It doesn't just come on on its, on its own. Every app service has this thing associated with it, or it's associated with an app service plan. And what is an app service plan? We're going to be pretty quick with this in the interest of time. If we look on the left hand side of my screen here, you can see in the on prem world, say you have a website, right? A website would run on a server or a server farm, right? So it could be physical, it could be a virtual machine. Apologies for my crew drawing. I know what you're thinking. I didn't go to art school. Um, and with that, you have considerations of storage, CPU, RAM, you know, compute resource. Uh, each one of those will have services running, IIS, other services, you'll have files on there, things like that, right? If for some reason you need to beef up your website, you know, cater for more um, traffic coming in, something like that, right? You may need to increase your storage, CPU, RAM, network potentially, that, that kind of thing. You would need to purchase physical kit, right? Or reconfigure the, the existing kit or something like that. So that's kind of on-prem, that's a quick talk about on-prem, you'd have a physical or virtual server that hosts your website. Or over on the right-hand side where you've got Azure, if we look first like over here, right? So we have an app service. And again, it's not just for web apps, but I'm gonna be talking in the context of web apps right now. And now back in on-prem, you had no choice about the operating system, right? Whatever operating system your server is running, um, unless you're doing some virtualization, um, but I'm not going to talk about that really. Um, your, your code for your web app and the operating system need to, need to work together, right? So let's say I've got a web app that needs Windows. It needs to run on a Windows host. The equivalent in Azure, in, in the app service world, is an app service plan, okay? So that is the equivalent of a server farm. And actually, if we look down here, hopefully you can see We've got something, something in, in ARM, in Azure Resource Manager, which again, won't go into right now, is the concept of uh, resource providers and resource types. Every ARM resource, every Azure resource has a resource provider and a resource type. And for app service plans, it's literally Microsoft.web is a resource provider and the resource type is, is literally server farms. So an app service plan is a server farm, essentially. That's, that's how you can think about it. And you can see here, the operating system matters. So although you're not bound to an operating system, 
if you have a Windows app or an app that needs to be run on a Windows host, you need a Windows app service plan, which is essentially a server farm. Now, an app service plan defines the operating system, as I said, the VM or VMs, I'll talk about that in a second, and the region, okay? So you can't have an app service running on an app service plan in a different region, right? So here's my crudely drawn virtual machine running the services just as you would have on-prem. And you have the same considerations potentially, storage, CPU, RAM, that kind of thing. Now I may need to beef up my server, right? More, a bigger size in the VM world, right? Storage, CPU, RAM, whatever, I can scale up. If I don't necessarily need a bigger machine, but I need more instances, then I can scale out vertically and horizontally. So here's another virtual machine, right? Now with app service plans, and this is what catches a lot of people out I've, I've seen, and I'm not quite sure why, is you can run multiple app services on a single app service plan, as long as the operating system matches that of the app service plan. And you'd need the resources there, right? So if you've got spare resources, um, compute resource, you, you know, your initial web app isn't using all the resources, by all means, add another app service to the app service plan. One thing to note here is that if you need to scale, whether it's scaling up or scaling out, so more instances or the existing instances being more powerful, every app, every app service that's running on that app service plan will scale together. So in this case where we've got two app services, if I add more instances, like let's say I add five instances to my app service plan, again, that's the physical hardware, that's, that's the kit that you're running on. Both of these will run across those instances. You don't scale an app, you scale an app service. And then this just, just illustrates here, if I had a Linux app service, I would need to run that on a Linux app service plan. I can't mix and match. And actually you used to not even be able to have the same like Windows app service plan and Linux app service plan in the same resource group um, previously, but that got changed a while ago. Now, if you've got a Linux app service plan that actually runs in a container and you can still scale up, you can still scale out, um, but that's Linux. It's running on its own container and you can bring your own containers for your actual um, app service as well. So that's super kind of quick about app services, app service plans. It was really important that people understand that, that information about app service plans. And then one thing, we've got a few topics, but one thing I wanna to touch on now before we kind of move into a demo is the authentication flow specific to app services. Okay, and what I'm specifically talking about is something that generally gets called easy auth. Okay, so we're talking about the built in authentication um, capabilities without doing so I'm going to be focusing on the without the provider SDK. So easy auth allows you to implement um, authentication in your app service without doing any code, either minimum or minimal or no code. Okay. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So what this, and the reason I'm showing you this is one, this is actually an image from the book. So if you find this useful, check out the book. <laughs> um, but also I'm going to actually show you step by step. I'll show you in the developer tools in my browser, how we can actually track this all happening. It's, it's actually quite cool. So the first thing to do, if I try to navigate to my app service, to my web app in this case, you won't really see, but it redirects to my app service hostname slash dot auth slash login slash provider, which in my case, I'm gonna use Microsoft. I'm gonna use Azure AD. So it will be AAD on the end. And then the thing we will be able to see is once we authenticate, we, we configure, and I'll show you that as well, we configure a, a redirect URL, a callback address, which basically says, hey, look, I'm going to, now that you've authenticated with the provider, I'm gonna pass you back to this URL. So dot or slash login, slash AAD, slash callback. And with that will come my authenticated cookie. So I will get a response with my cookie. 
saying, you are, this is your session, this is an authenticated app service session, here's your cookie. And then what happens is that that cookie then gets used in any subsequent requests. So even if I just refresh the page, something like that, I will be able to see in the dev tools that I am using that same cookie that I was granted um, in my authenticate, as part of my authenticated session. So that's what we're gonna do now. If we have more time, we'll go into a few other things as well. Um, and folks, please stop me if you wanna, if you've got any questions or anything as well. But for now, I'll just assume everything's good. So moving across into the Azure portal, hopefully I don't need to explain the Azure portal to anybody, um, but I've got here my streaming clouds. I've got it, you can't have it. Um, streaming clouds uh, <laughs> app service here. <Yeah>. Nice. <laughs> um, and what I've got, as far as actually, as far as like quick start, if you, if you wanna get running with this, um, just be mindful there is a quick start um, a quick start um, blade here that you can you can make use of. And if you go to quick start here, you can select your relevant language and it will help you create those um, create those resources. So anyway, authentication. So for easy auth, we look down here under settings, we've got authentication. So I'm going to click on authentication. At the moment, by the way, just to show you all this does if I browse to the app, is it just displays a very basic um, very basic text, right? This is text setting me up for the, uh, for the demo later, or if we, if we have time, but I'm going to click authentication. I need to add an identity provider. Now this is, you know, we build all of our, like the Microsoft identity platform as well is all built on top of, um, OIDC, open ID connect and OAuth as well. So that's why we have multiple identity providers here. So we've got Apple. Um, GitHub, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and OpenID Connect. So any identity provider that's using standard OpenID um, Connect. So I'm going to select Microsoft, which is Azure AD in this case. And now, real briefly, I'm going to talk about what this means. Actually, I'm going to create it, and then I'll talk about what this means. So, so yeah, I'll create it, and then I'll, I'll talk you through it. It's, it's probably going to be, uh, make more sense. So I'm going, to, I'm going to create a new app registration or service principle, and I'll, uh, sorry, yeah, app registration, which will also create a service principle, which I'll talk about. It's going to be a single tenant app, meaning only users within my Azure Active Directory will be able to authenticate, which I'm fine with. Now, these, these two parts here are worth paying attention to. So I'm saying in order to access my app, I don't have anything I want to allow unauthenticated requests to, you know, maybe you have like a members only or something where you need to log in, but then everything else is public. I'm not doing that. I'm going to require authentication. Anyone that goes to my site needs to authenticate. So that's one thing that's worth paying attention to. The second thing is if somebody comes and they are unauthenticated, so they haven't yet got an authenticated session, so therefore they don't have an authentication cookie. What do I want to do? In my case, and it's the default, is I'm going to use a 302 found um, HTTP response, which is recommended for websites, as you can see. And that will redirect to Microsoft, right? Now, I could do other things. I could say it's a 401, it's unauthorized, 403, forbidden, or I could lie to them and say not found. I don't know what you're talking about. This doesn't exist. But I'm going to just use 302. Permissions, I'll go into that in a second as well. This is just enough to log the user in. These are the bare minimums to be able to log someone in on behalf of that user. So I'm going to click add, and that's going to add the identity provider. Now, at this point, if you're not familiar with app registrations or service principles, SPNs, as they're often called, um, don't worry, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. So that is my authentication enabled already. That's it done. So. I now could, I'm not going to right now, but I could log into or browse to that website and I will be challenged to log in. I will be asked to log in. What I do want to talk about is app registrations and service principles. That's something that's often misunderstood. And actually I didn't fully understand it until I started writing the book and then I got a great understanding of it, which is really good. Now, if I click on this, it would take me directly there. Um, so 
does that bring me to yeah i'll show you the the longer way around i suppose if i go into azure active directory and i go to app registrations i will be able to see my streaming clouds app registration now something that's key to understand app registration versus um service principle let's call it or enterprise application that'll probably be the easiest way and by the way enterprise application service principle same thing you have an app registration which is the global um, representation of my application that's needed to um, integrate with Azure Active Directory. Okay, And that's what you're looking at here. So there is only ever going to be one, until I delete this, don't worry, you can have this, you can have the host name, I'm not, I'm not actually keeping it. Um, but I will only ever have, until I delete it, have one global um, app registration to represent my app anywhere. Now, if it was a multi-tenant application, as in someone from any other um, Active Directory tenant could access my app and log in, if I had set that up, that wouldn't change. I would still just have one app registration. And within this app registration, I have various details, right? You can see I've got like client IDs and things like that. I can also set up branding so I can have logos, terms of use, lots of different lots of different things like that right i can set up authentication requirements um i can also set up where is it api permissions in this case my application is granted permission to the microsoft graph technically it's like graph.microsoft.com slash user slash read that's what it translates to to the api and that's basically saying someone tries to log in using Microsoft using um, an Azure Active Directory account, which is backed by Microsoft Graph. I can log them in because I'm reading their, their information. And it's a delegated permission, which means there needs to be a user present and I will act on their behalf. That's what this means. And that's all I need. That's the minimum to be able to log someone in. Uh, I can add a bunch of other stuff. And in fact, one thing I am gonna do, I'm gonna add a custom app role. So I'm saying the global representation of my app will have a, I'm just gonna call this a demo role. And I'll allow users and groups, I'm gonna give it a value of demo role, um, streaming clouds, there you go. Description just for a demo, right? Now, again, this is my global representation. Now, if somebody else, so if someone from, let's say, Streaming Clouds Active Directory tries to log into my app, what will happen is they will get an enterprise application, here we go, that represents their, uh, in, their use of my application. Okay, so we have one global, and that's in my home tenant, they call it, app registration, only one per app but it's a one-to-many relationship. You can see streaming clouds here, and that's what you would get in your Azure Active Directory. If you try to use my account, what it would do is it would query, it would, it would take the details, the metadata from my app registration and create the application object or the enterprise application or the service principle in your tenant, okay? That's what it is. So the app registration is a template and the enterprise application uses that template to create itself, basically. So if I had any branding or any specific stuff in my app registration, you would see it in here as well. So if I go to properties now, you can see homepage URL. Um, let me actually get rid of the masks. There we go. So you can see my homepage URL. That is based and copied from my global representation, my app registration. So I hope that makes sense, but that's something a lot of people don't quite understand is they call app registration service principles. It's not the same thing. App registrations, you only have one ever per application in the home tenant where it's created. App, uh, enterprise applications is per, um, per tenant. And the benefit of that, or one of the things you can do with that is say, okay, for my implementation, my use of it, I'm going to, uh, 
I'm going to set up conditional access, for example. I'm not going to do that in the interest of time, but you could do that. You could. It's not a requirement from me, the person that created it, but maybe a requirement that you want to put to say, we will only allow members of our tenant to use that account and authenticate with that um, that application, sorry, providing they meet my conditional access criteria. One thing I am going to do in my tenant as my enterprise application is I'm going to add a user. I'm going to add myself when I spell my own name correctly. And I only have one role. And you can see I have been assigned to the demo role. If we had more than that, then I would be able to select another role. I mean, I can even edit me now uh, and I can select just the one role that we have, right? So what I've done is in my app registration, my global representation of the application, I've said, hey, here's the custom roles that you can use. And in my tenant, my local copy, my enterprise application, I've said this person can have that role. Question. That's a lot. Sorry, Karen. Does that does that mean that that the global re representation um, is unique? It needs to be unique as well. It it will be un It'll have a unique. Uh, it doesn't need to be a unique name, but it'll mm -hmm. have a unique um, client ID, and that's really what gets used. Tenant ID and client ID. Those will be unique. Yep. Awesome. I love the explanation. It took me a while, like like a couple of years ago, to wrap my head around. Like, oh, what are we talking about? Like. Service principle, Same. right? Searching, searching, searching. Wait a minute. It's an enterprise app. Oh, okay. And then I had this problem of, okay, I have this app registration. Why is this not working, right? Because I was missing the enterprise application. So, 100%. Yeah. you know, and if you add some graph permissions and all that stuff on top, then it becomes, uh, well, yep. pretty complex, pretty fast. And, and actually, it's, I'm glad you said that because although we won't have time for it now, the book actually covers that as well. So you actually talk about the different permission types, the different consent types, um, how that gets presented. Um, yeah, really, really useful for getting a proper understanding of how graph works as well. So, so that's good. Awesome. We'll we'll put a link to your book in uh, in the description as well. So if you're interested, Perfect. then uh, we'll make sure that you find your way. It's not that I mean, big, right? Look at that. It's, it's oh, fine. Come on. <laughs> Pure, yeah. Purely, like I'm going to be using that as like anyone asks me about app registrations and service principles, I'm going to have that bookmark then that book. <laughs> Do it, man. I, I I even have the feeling like okay, I think I'm going to add the 204 to my list of, of certifications for next year because <laughs> no, it, you know the it's, more it's that we're right? cloud yeah. native and and the better I understand how developers operate in, within Azure, the better I can uh, enable them um, to to do their work, right and Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. well, I want to say end, but that's that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, I suppose one of the benefits that I had, um, so it's obviously co-authored. I want to take the, 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 the limelight here. Like Alex has done great work as well, but as I'm here, I'll talk about myself. Um, so <laughs> because, because part of the, or a big part of the reason for me taking on the project of the book was to, for my own learning, what that's enabled me to do is I don't even need to think back, right? I, it was quite easy for me to go, well, logically, how did I get my head around this? How did I wrap from, you know, let's say from, from a baseline of nothing, like no knowledge, I didn't have like literally no knowledge, but from almost no knowledge to what I have to pass the exam, what did I do? What did I build? Because that was a big part of it is building demos, building applications to learn it. And then I just put that in the book. And so hopefully for anyone that's starting from, you know, not an expert level, they, they'll have a logical progression and logical learning. Same with containers as well. Hopefully that the explanation we have in there for containers should hopefully be really useful. And there are a lot of code snippets in here as well, right? So you can actually follow along with, with, with the stuff. There's that, code snippets. Yeah, there's code snippets in there. There's also links to the GitHub repo as well, where you can actually just download the code um, it, rather than trying to copy paste or type it out from reading it as well. So, I've enabled authentication. I'm going to copy the URL. I'm going to open an in private browser window, open up my dev tools. And now if we remember back to this authentication flow, we're expecting to see, let's look at the second one down on the left. 
to get redirected to the callback address. So I'm going to put the URL in there. And I'm being challenged to log in, which I wouldn't have been previously, or wasn't previously. Now if I click here on my streaming clouds, et cetera, et cetera, let me um, boost this up slightly. I'm getting a 302 redirect. Again, this is why I pointed that out. I chose for this to happen. I said require authentication and any unauthenticated um, requests get a 302. In addition to that, if I look down here, it's um, it actually doesn't look too bad. You can see the endpoint here. Um, but the main thing I want to see is the response type. So what I expect to get back is a code and ID token. Okay. But also, though you can't see the RE there, but that's redirect URI. Okay, so once I get authenticated, where am I supposed to be sent? And as we expected, we've got the URL dot slash dot auth slash login slash AAD, which is the provider, and then slash callback. So exactly what we saw here in the second one down. All right. So this all hopefully makes sense. And you can see why I introduced this now and how it helped me actually learn as well. So, OK. Um, something real quick I want to talk about with cookies, just really quickly. People sometimes ask, what is this? ARR Affinity, ARR Affinity, same site, right? Uh, essentially, all this is is that if you have multiple instances of an application, although App Services isn't really supposed to be stateful, itself, um, you can achieve a certain amount of state if you are using, if you are connecting to the same VM, right? So you might have multiple instances, you visit the site, and you might want to revisit the site, and we want you to be on the same virtual machine. That's what this does. That's all you need to know. You can turn it off in app services, but that's all it is. The reason there's two is um, same site. The same site one is a newer convention. Um, the old one that just ARR affinity is just there for backwards compatibility. But that's all that is, if ever anybody wonders. You can disable that. Is that similar to like sticky sessions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, same concept. Right. Right, okay. Okay. So if I log in here, I yeah, spelled that right, looks like it. Now, I'm going to just clear this real quick. Log in. It's asking me for permissions view your basic profile info. I didn't grant any more. I don't need any more, but that's what I showed you in the app service. So I'm going to accept. And we can see callback. So that's the callback address you can see. And now if I look at that callback address, you can see my, my uh, payload. I hate the way this is showing now. It used to show really nicely. But my payload here has, just bear with me one second. I think that's it, yeah. This actually, you can't really see, but this that I've just copied is the ID token from App Services. So again, this is exactly what I showed you in the, in the flow. It's passed, it's, it's presented me to the call, it's redirected me to the callback URI, and it's I've got an ID token now. Now, what does that ID token do? Um, I will show you. I will show you in a second. For now, you can see if I go to cookies, I have still have the ARR thing, but I also have app service auth session as a response cookie. So app services has said, "Hey, here's your session cookie. Here, you are authenticated. Here's your cookie." So, OK, that's cool. Everything's working fine. Now let's test it out. If I go to, let's say, let's clear this. So that's ZUZ as a start. If I click on privacy, uh, actually, let me clear it and then click on something. There we go. I can now see in my, so that was a response. I can see in the requests, I'm now using that same authenticated cookie in my requests. So this is how I actually learn authentication is once you understand the flow, you can actually watch it step by step exactly what's happening. So I've been able to track that 
that HTTP 302 response, I've been able to track my authenticate my my callback URL um, or being re redirected to the callback URL, and I've been able to track my authenticated session cookie given to me, and then me using that cookie to say, hey, I'm already authenticated with you, give me something. The only other thing I said I was going to show you is that ID token. Now, if I go to jwt.ms, I can decode that token. So if I paste it in here, I can see the decoded token. Got a lot of details here. The main one to pay attention to down here is I have those that role and any roles that I said. All right. So again, in my global representation, my app registration, I created a role. In my local Azure Active Directory, I assigned that role to the enterprise application, my implementation of the application. And now I've been able to go on, follow the authentication flow, follow the cookies. And now I've even been able to take the ID token that was used in the payload. And I've been able to decode that and see that as part of my ID token, it gives me all these details, my email address and everything, whole load of other information I probably shouldn't show on stream. Um, but this is a lab account, so you know, email it, I don't care. Um, but I can also see, I can also with decoded, I can see my claims. And as part of my claims, which we have here, as part of my claims, I have my roles. So from an authentication perspective, this is all in the book. It's all in the book exactly, pretty much step by step, exactly what I've just shown you. So with that, I'm just checking there wasn't anything authentication wise I wanted to show you that I haven't. No. So the only other thing I said, if I do, if we do have time is deployment slots. Do we have time guys or should we? Yeah. Yeah. It? yeah. We do have I time? just what, I wanted to just highlight this. I didn't even know this tool existed. That's what I love when we have people come on and they Did show you? these, these nuggets, right. Of, of gold. So JWT.ms, right. Yep. Just comes in here. And obviously, you know, if you were troubleshooting or you're trying to do efficiencies, like you said, right, trying to understand the logical breakdown of how our how authentication works, right, with Azure AD and, and yep. an app service, you can grab the code from the developer tools from the browser, bring it to this site, and it will translate it to a more palatable form, should we say, right? So you can understand it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. And this and a lot more um, is in the book. And that, so this was just from the app services um, part of the book, not even the authentication and authorization part of the book. So as we're going into this kind of detail in app services, just imagine if you want to learn more about um, authentication, just the amount of stuff that we go into in, in that part of the book is really cool. I, well, really cool if you're a nerd, but you know, I found it really cool. I'm a nerd. But identity is huge, but it ties into everything, right? I always say with Azure, Azure AD is like, if you think of uh, Azure as a pyramid, Azure AD is at the top and everything trickles, you know, it trickles down into absolutely everything, right? And yeah. there's, there's different capabilities or different integrations depending on the SKU that you're deploying. But no, I mean, it's a really good uh, uh chapter section whatever you want to call it i think mean, you know just just getting that background information and identity is really important right so cool yeah. all right so now that we're talking about the book as well uh, john mm -hmm. has a question mm -hmm. he asks is the book only available as hard copy or online as well uh so in it's not just hard copy we've got hard copies because we can just go hey um but yeah it's on <laughs> amazon on kindle as well um so and it's cheaper in the electronic uh, copy as well. So yeah. Awesome. Cool. Available at all good retailers. Right? All good so, retailers. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, you said you're going to have the link in the um, description as well, right? Yeah. 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 We'll feed it out. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll uh, use a uh, URL short, short, uh, short yeah, I've, servers. I've got the direct short ones as well. If you want, okay, um, I can, I can share those with you. So, uh, so we do have time, do you think to go through deployment slots? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. yeah. We've got 10 minutes. All right, cool. Just one other thing I wanted to mention that I didn't is, and it's a common thing people don't consider as well, is that just because your app is in the cloud or your API is in the cloud, doesn't mean it can't talk to your on-premises devices, right? I do have a demo, but we won't have time for it. Um, but in, if I go to networking down here, 
we can see outbound traffic, we've got a thing called hybrid connections. Again, a topic maybe for another day if people are interested, um, but hybrid connections essentially says my, or, or how it works is your application could make an outbound call to like your on-prem database or something, and it would make an outbound call to a relay. It's, it's literally called a relay, <laughs> it's, uh, using service bus uh, relay, um, but it's a specific implementation for app services. And then your on-prem server would, or, or in your on-prem network, you would have something called a hybrid connection manager, which is just a piece of software running as a service on another machine that's got connectivity to your database, for example. That would also be making outbound calls over 443 to the relay. And then that creates a secure tunnel so that your app can make outbound calls to your on-prem services. So I won't go into any more detail right now. It's really cool, really easy to set up, but that's a big thing that people often think, hey, I've got a cloud app, I can't do anything on-prem. Do you know what? That that must be, I don't know when that got released, but I had a requirement a few years back and I had to deploy those massive app service environments, right? Just for VNet integration, Ooh. right? And they got, ex they're expensive, but there's pros to it from a security and governance point of view, right? It's PCI yeah. compliant and all that good stuff. Yeah, but it used sure. to be able to start on VNet and like what you've just said there, Paul, you know, we had to speak to an on-premise um, like data warehouse, I could, like you said, like a database instance, yep. and that was the scenario, right? And that's how, that's what we needed to do. But now you can do it on an individual app service plan, right? Which is going to remove the complexity of the architecture as well. So that's good. It takes to see. a few seconds to set up as well. It's really easy. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, that basically means inbound firewall is still closed, right? So you don't have to open any inbound ports, only outbound from your on-premises environment, four for three to the internet and then the piece of software that's running inside of your on-premises data center will reach out to the relay and then it will set up a secure connection, right? Correct, yep. yep. It's all outbound from both directions to the relay, yep. That's good to so, know. Yeah, it's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do a demo like this when I'm training or, or with this um, and it's it's really nice to see like a cloud API or a cloud website calling my API that I'm running locally. It's It's really nice. Anyway, that's we, we digress. It's such app services is such a huge thing, right? What I want to talk about briefly is deployment slots. So now the concept of deployment slots is um, pretty straightforward. Um, if I switch back here, scroll down my, my horrible drawing, deployment slots essentially works as, let's say by default, you have a production environment, right? Something that's that's readily accessible to anyone that hits your I mean, depending on authentication and stuff, right? Anybody that's ready can just visit that. And that we're considering as production. You can create another, app, depending on the app service plan, you can create a certain amount, you know, 10, maybe 20, maybe 30, depending on the app service plan you select, um, de um, deployment slots. Doesn't need to be called staging. That's just a very common one. Could be dev, could be something else, whatever. And it's technically, it's intrinsically linked, but it's technically its own application. So all of the settings, the configuration settings, things like that, that you can set up on an app, you can set up on a staging or on a deployment slot as well, right? Because it's just an application. And the idea is that if we look at here, you can see my, my incredible drawing of something in the browser window. Um, so someone's browsing, by default, their traffic will be routed to the production environment. Simple, right? If you then create another state, uh, another slot, so we're calling it staging here, and you want like a beta experience, you want to say, okay, my code has been pushed to the staging slot. I'm not ready to roll it out to production, but I want people to be able to test it. And then we can have a way of routing the traffic to the staging slot. That's essentially it. It's so that I can push my code, um, like my code, I could push it, especially if I'm doing CI CD, I could push it to the staging slot, get validation, understand, is it okay? Is it ready to go before I then push it into production so I can run my tests? That's supposed to be an arrow. Um, now, why am I talking about this? So it's another cool thing that we can, we can look at in the dev tools and I will do, just conscious of time. 
there this is all controlled by the way you can control it by cli you can control it by um the portal and things like that but what actually happens what actually dictates where your traffic gets rooted i mean behind the scenes it's a load balancer but it's actually a um a, a, a cookie and it's this cookie the xms routing name that's when you it, it won't show if you only have the main slot you don't have any additional deployment slots but if you have more than one and I visit the production site, the value of this cookie will be self. Self is just the default slot. If I wanted to override and say, I don't want you to control it, I want to be able to opt in, I want to be able to per session, click on a button and get rooted to whatever the, the beta or the staging app is, then I could change this as a query parameter to staging. And all of my traffic, even though my URL won't be the staging slot, because the staging slot has its own URL, it'll be you know, streaming clouds .azure, uh, streaming clouds dash uh, staging .azurewebsites.net. But I don't need to do that. What I see as a user is the same URL, but my traffic gets routed to the staging slot based on this um, query parameter. So to show you that in action relatively quickly and to show you deployment slots, if I go to deployment slots here, I can add a new slot, but you can see, if I um, zoom in slightly, you can see I've got streaming clouds, which is my production, and then I've got screen, um, streaming clouds staging as well. I can change the percentage of traffic. So I can say what percentage, you know, 50% of requests, you know, new requests that come in will go to my staging, 50% go to production, gradual rollout, that's quite a common thing to do as well. I can click swap. And now what I actually have, just to show you for the demo, is if I go into configuration here, I've got an application setting called slot name. And in the production slot, I've called it production because I'm original. <laughs> and then in the staging slot, I've called it staging. Yeah, I really went all out. And these are exposed, application settings are exposed as environment variables. So my code in the website is just querying for a slot name environment variable. So we should be able to see whether I'm in the staging slot or the production slot based on an output that reads that variable. So that's why I'm mentioning that now. And now, if I was doing this manually, I can click on swap. I'm not going to finish this. And I can say, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna swap staging with production. In my case, I've only got two, so it's obvious. And I can see what the config changes are. I really like this. So you can see the changes to the source are going to be the slot name. It's an app setting. The old value is staging. The new value is going to be production. All right, so you can actually see what's going to happen beforehand. And if I check this box here, the preview uh, perform swap with preview, I would be able to do it in a multi-stage approach as well. I'm not going to actually do that because what I want to show you is actually I'm going to turn off authentication just to um, make it less um, noisy. So I'm going to remove authentication real quick. Here we go. So if I browse to this app and I have 12 and I go to, uh, it didn't come up in time. Where's my, there it is. You can see here in my cookie, the XMS routing name is self. I didn't do anything fancy. I went to the root URL, but because I have more than one uh, deployment slot, it's gone to self. I'm going to zoom in slightly there. Now, in my, in my application, you can see this is production. So this is the production slot. If I click on this, all that's doing, if I actually copy the link, you can see what it's doing. It's just setting the... Um, a query parameter to forward my traffic to the staging slot. And that will overwrite the cookie. So same URL, I've clicked on that same URL, you can see the query parameter. Now it's reading staging. So I'm in the staging slot. And if I refresh, I'm still in the staging slot, I can go wherever I want. Notice this hasn't changed, the URL is not changing. But my traffic is going to the staging slot, still going to the staging slot, I can control F5, staging slot. And now the cool thing is, if I refresh just to show you, I can see that my query parameter being changed to staging has overwritten the cookie. 
So I can override the cookie using a query parameter, and the cookie also gets changed based on the settings um, that I set in my deployment slots over here. So if I set everything to 100% to staging, I mean, it's the same as doing a slot without changing certain configuration, I guess, then that cookie would also be set to staging. And with that, I think that's everything I wanted to show you. Um, we don't have time to do any of the other cool stuff. <laughs> I think there's a lot more that we could possibly go into, and it's always the way. But Paul, that was a fantastic session. You know, we touched identity, we touched you know what an, you know what a web app and an app service plan was, and you know the, the the quirks if you want, or the configurations that you need to look out for, right? Be that a Windows service plan or a Linux service plan, depending on your stack. And then, you know, the, the whole breakdown and the tools around how to test your authentication and the integration around. Um, no. You're breaking up, Kev. <laughs> oh. We were doing so well. Yeah. Oh, well. Then I'll finish it, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Oh, man, it was an awesome session. You know, I'm, I'm already going through the book and, and look at the authentication authorization chapter and some other chapters just to, you know, brush up some fundamental knowledge. Awesome. And then, uh, it's useful. yeah, you know, and it was really great session. Time went really fast, you know, so, um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, or we, because I'm talking for Kevin now as well. Um, I think we would love to have you back, man, uh, for, yeah. for another session. Let's see what we can come up with. For sure. Um, I'm going to ask the audience if there's something you would like to see, um, something you would like Paul to touch upon or, or whatever, then let us know in the comments. Kevin's back. Welcome back. I'm back. All right. <laughs> well, we're all wrapping up, right? I said that the session went really fast. Um, I'm definitely going to reading a couple of chapters of the book, even though I'm not Same taking thing. the exam at this point. But, um, but yeah, well, let's see. Patty uh, is here. Thanks, Paddy. Hey, Paddy. <laughs> Subscribe, like, <laughs> join the community. Oh, wait, we can, we can do that. Oh, what is this? Hello, I pressed the wrong button. Oh, yeah, I think so. Nice. Kevin needs to reboot his router. <laughs> Kevin's already done that. Yeah, yeah, I posted that at the beginning. <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Paul already mentioned, right. right? If you want to connect with us or, or some other you know, awesome community folks, then um, join us in the Extreme Clouds community, community.streamingclouds.io. Um, and like Paul already said, like, don't forget to like, subscribe, and da -da -da -da, hit that bell icon. Oh, starting to become like a real icon, YouTuber, right? right? So, Kev. Yeah, I will try and try and wrap this up again. But yeah, thanks again, Paul. We're definitely getting you back on. You're doing that GitHub session, right? So I'm going to get that booked in for early next year, right? So I think we could, I mean, the community could bask in your knowledge by the sounds of it, right? So uh, no, it was a great session and thanks for coming. Again, thanks to Robin, my co-host, right? Always making sure everything's working in the background and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Don't be a stranger. Bye. Cheers.